three, two, one. Welcome, this is Mark from the Studio Life. We're on the campus of MBS Media Campus and we continue to be hanging out talking studio shit. <laughs> this is what we, it's what we like to do, right? We sit around, oh, we you, talk studio talk shit. shit. Yeah, that's what they're for. <laughs> so today we're gonna go back and we're gonna talk about something that changed my life. I mean, you know, you're, you. you're my, uh, you. my mentor here and um, <laughs> when we first met, I was a lawyer. You were. I was a, I was, I was a good for nothing, Load. I mean, I helped a lot of. I helped some artists. Did a few things here uh -huh. and there that uh -huh. I liked and was proud of. But overall, I was a hobbyist. Uh -huh. And today on the, the Studio Life, we're here with one of the most amazing sports photographers of all time. Forget. Uh -huh. I know. Yeah, I know. I know. It always sounds weird to say that, but you've got some unique company uh, there, and yeah. it, it, I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to talk photography and sports right. and, and the all business right. and how yeah. things are evolving. So, yeah, everybody. Peter Reed Miller, Peter Reed Miller, Hello. this is everybody. So, Peter, we met at a seminar, and you were teaching sports photography. Yes, I was. And you were teaching it to people, I don't remember how many people, maybe 10 of us. Mm, I think maybe, which one was that, with Tennessee? or uh, Denver. Uh, Denver. Yeah, Denver. Oh, wow, wow, so you've done like three then, haven't you? Uh, well, I've been with you for more yeah. than that. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah it, it, my, my, uh, clientele, my crowd, has sort of changed over the years. I mean, they really, they, I, people were really very amateurish before, mm -hmm. and uh, I was thinking about that because Canon cameras, who are my, my, uh, I'm affiliated with, they would send out gear, and I would have to have them send out a lot of gear because these people didn't have anything to, to shoot sports with. And now I've got a workshop coming up in Eugene. I've got 12 people in it, and. Uh, of the seven who've returned their surveys, all of them have 400 two eights. Oh my God. I know, it's like, what am I gonna ask for? But it's a weird time because everybody's going mirrorless, so I can get a bunch of mirrorless stuff that maybe they don't have. But, but it's, it's a whole different level of commitment on the part of people, whether it's people with more money or they're choosing to spend more money on sports or they figured out that this is what they need. But uh, I don't have to answer that one dreaded question anymore, which is how do I shoot high school football at night? But let me ask you, because this, this is not necessarily a good thing, that everyone has 400 no, 2 No, no, no. In, in when we were hobbyists, it was a, a blessing to be able to go to your seminar yeah. and be able to work with gear that we would not normally have right, ever had. Right, But are these people working with that gear, or are they rich people who bought gear and they're not making a living, or are they out-of-work photographers? You like, know, I, I don't really know. I mean, I haven't done a workshop because of COVID for three years. Uh, Previous to that, I the sense was uh, probably about half of them are making some money at photography. Uh, you always get the occasional parent who just wants to shoot their kid. Uh, but I've had some pretty good photographers, or people have gone on to be very good photographers, working at uh, colleges, schools. That's a big, big uh, source because colleges always need pictures. They need pictures for their website. They need pictures. They're, they're, colleges are all in the business of selling themselves. And how do you sell? You sell with pictures. So a lot of people work for colleges. Uh, you know, I've had some people work for agencies. And, uh, you know, more and more, it's, it, they realize that they're going to have to do something more to, to justify this $25,000 worth of equipment that they have than just go out and take pictures of the little kids playing football. But are they trying to satisfy that to their spouse? <laughs> and at some question. point, it's twenty five thousand yeah. dollars worth of gear, and the, and it doesn't end there because they're paying for seminars. And, yeah, you know, computers. I, you know, I, I really don't know. I mean, I think to a lot of them, it's just an urge they had. I mean, what I what I get now is I get a lot of people who made their money early, who made their money at at by fifty, or by even even younger than that. You know, not super gazillionaires, but people who just gotten comfortable. And are willing to don't want to do the job they were doing, and so they they've always wanted to be a photographer or at least try photography. So that's kind of where they they've got the money to get the gear, and then they take classes like mine and like you know uh, there's several around. There's a lot. Uh, Scott Kelby puts them on, mm -hmm. and and, the, and you know the summit. So they start taking classes to try and kind of uh, bring themselves up to speed. Now, once they're out of this, 
maybe they have some more skills than they had going yes. in. Hopefully they do. Yeah. But are they then charging for their work? Or are they adding to a pool that is causing ultimately problems <laughs> to me? I mean, we, I mean, this is the the age old question, which is yeah, yeah. You know, and we were if we were to sit down and talk to the McNallys of the world, they'd yeah. say, "What's wrong with pe- giving your stuff away for free if you're getting some exposure?" Yeah, but it does have an impact on on the business, right? Um, do you feel that th- these people are having a, a ultimately a positive impact on on the business? It's not. I'm not trying to load the question, right? Up and and no. it's not a gotcha. I, I think it's kind of half and half. I think some of these people are genuinely uh, working at good jobs and contributing and then there are the people who just go out and shoot for free. And that's that's as as the equipment has become more attainable because their incomes are up and uh, the teams on the other hand don't want to pay so they, they know their people out there. There's also such a demand for social media material so much more material than they used to need that most teams, like an NFL team, will really have like eight or 10 people shooting for them. And a lot of them, you look at them and you say, but they're doing, you know, some, they got, they got uh, young people with, with iPhones out there shooting stuff and boom, it's going right up on social media. And, right. and, and it's, and you know, all people see it's on the phone. They're not really looking for a quality picture. They just wanna say, oh, this is a picture from the game that's going on right now, you know. So there's that, uh, but then there are a lot of people who just are willing to, to uh, you know, even have their regular jobs still, that are willing to go out at night. There's a guy at the Oakland A's. Um, I don't know if he was there the year you were or not, but he was in, in the, be in the third base box, right in the corner, shooting with good lens, Nikon, two to four, something like that, and somebody asked him what he was doing, and he said, well, I shoot for MLB. Yeah. That might have been me that asked him. Yeah, I remember and, that and, conversation. And he, and he gets he makes seventy five dollars a night. Seventy five bucks. And he's got a day job over at that uh, the big nuclear lab, uh, Livermore, mm-hmm. Livermore Lab. And he pops over at night and on the weekends and makes the seventy five bucks and feels like he's doing something. Yeah, he's got to buy his own gear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's um, he's got to pay for his own parking, I think. Right. Wow. <laughs> um, so he's not. It's it is it is probably a net negative. Yeah, if you factor in gas, especially these days, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. probably a negative negative thing. But he's there. He wants to be there. That's that's he's part of the MLB. So yeah, you know. So let let me ask you. Um, it, it seems almost uh, regardless of what level of sports photography you're working on, that there are almost only two models. That that what people kind of joke about with the spray and pray model, mm-hmm. and that a lot of photographers are. Have been successful at that model. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's the model of Max Preps and others, right? To an extent where you go out, you get as much as you can. You hope yeah. some of it is as good as possible. That yeah. that there's some demand. And the other one is sort of a retained model. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm sure you've probably done both. I mean, even mm-hmm. at SI, it's sometimes it's a retained model with an assignment, and you pick up some spray and pray stuff here and there. Yeah, and yeah, you never know what you're going to get. But mm-hmm. but w- what's kind of the story with these two models and ha- you know, how are they affecting the industry? Well, I mean, the industry as it was when we talk about Sports Illustrated, I mean, it kind of doesn't exist anymore. There are no, there are no magazines giving, or very, very few magazines giving very, very few assignments to photographers these days. So pretty much, it, it's some, you know, they're either spraying and praying or they're spraying with some guidance. And, and praying. But there's not a lot of money coming out out front for anybody anymore. Unless there, you know, there are very few. There are a couple of USA Today staffers left, and LA Times. The big papers still have staff photographers, but fewer and fewer. Yeah, but those staff photographers, because they're staff photographers, there are new licensing issues. Those staff photographers are now work well, for hires. Correct? They work for hire. Yeah, yeah, that's an ad. At Sports Illustrated, I was a, a contributor, a contractor for 20 years, and then uh, in '90. Seven or ninety-eight. I went on staff, and so from that point on, I really didn't, you know, I didn't own my stuff. Although they were kind enough to actually give us a percentage of the resale, but those were the days when people were nice, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, now the reason why that kid's out there for seventy-five bucks is so that they could get those pictures yeah. for free. Yeah. yeah. I mean, basically, it's the cheapest license yeah. uh, that money can buy. Right. Um, well, well, we work. I mean. Currently, I work for AP Images. I'm a contributor, meaning that I'm all, it's all on my own nickel. If I want to travel, my gear, everything, and I can put up 350 images from each game. 
And basically, that's what I do. And the thing about the AP is they have the commercial license for the NFL. So if you are an advertiser, a Sony or a Chevrolet or whomever, and you want to buy a picture, you have to go through them. And even if you don't buy a picture from them, you have to go through them and they get a, they get a cut. So the idea is that these pictures sell for a lot more than editorial rates. And once in a while they do. But there's a lot of, uh, of skullduggery that goes on in, in there trying to, they have added work for hire people doing the same thing we do. Um, they'd really like us to go away, but yeah. you know. So uh, let me um, let me ask about the sort of preparation. Is mm -hmm. I, I, you know I've obviously seen your work mm -hmm. for ever. Yeah. Um, some of the shots that you've done, I mean, they're remarkable, and they clearly take quite a bit of preparation. Are you seeing? I mean, tell me about w maybe something that is you know some of the one of the hardest pictures you've ever taken, and the follow up question, which I'm just going to throw out there is could you have done that again would you have been able to do that again in today's world uh well first of all i gotta tell you that this is a comment that i've heard for years from my my mentor and former boss steve fine he says photographers always like the picture that was hardest to take mm -hmm. it's not necessarily the best picture but they like it because it was the hardest to take right so um no i mean i think in terms of uh budgets i mean you know, I, we did a picture uh, a few years, well, 2012, because it was right before the London Olympics. It was one of the last years I worked there, of a USC quarterback. Uh, and an, it's an idea. It's been done before. I don't really like it because it's, it's pretty cut and dry. But it's through the, through the plexiglass, up to the plexiglass. So, and he's down over the ball. And it's not trivial to do. Uh, and we spent, and we did it right here in L.A. at, at USC, but I think we spent about $5,000 on that one picture. You know, $1,200 for the Lexan, I had a crew of five, I rented scaffolding, all that stuff. I don't know who would pay $5,000 for a picture like that these days. For the setup. Yeah, for the yeah. setup and for the bodies, for the people. I mean, uh, you know, it was, it was hard to convince Canon on that project I did for them recently on the 1200 millimeter lens. Some of the expenses that I incurred and some that I wanted to incur that they didn't want to, like going to Hawaii. <laughs> they didn't go for that. But, uh, but we did spend some money there, which was kind of like the old days, but not, there's not much of that around. You know, there just yeah. isn't. So some of the setups, for instance, and we were able to show some pictures up mm -hmm. here on the uh, Studio Life board. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very capable piece of cardboard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't like yeah, it's there. just cardboard, and yeah, yet yeah. it shows Amazing. pictures. Amazing. Um, we, you talked at one point about the uh, the arrow being shot, mm -hmm. the Be Beijing, right? Yeah, uh, Barcelona. Barcelona. Okay. Yeah. I mean, tell me about the preparation for a shot like well, that. Well, the preparation for that was going the two nights before to the uh, rehearsal for it was at the opening ceremony, and and uh, uh, Steve Fine and I went. I didn't really want to go because I'd just flown in, but he said, "Come on, this is you know," and we saw. This is how they were going to light the the torch, which is the big moment, the opening moment of the Olympics, with a flaming arrow shot from down in the stadium. So we walked around and kind of figured, here's a place where we could get that shot, get that wide shot. And it was not a photo area, but I was able to put a remote camera up there, just mount on a piece of pipe, and uh, boom, you know, there it goes. That was that was it. So that was that was sort of preparation of one kind. It wasn't a lot of physical building or anything like that but it was it was mental preparation and and but you had to calc did you do any calculation of the exposure time and figuring out how long the arrow would take or was it really just set it on five seconds what and he go? what he what he shot it i pushed the button and <laughs> when it landed when it went through the torch i took my finger off the button now, oh so it was on bulb mode yeah yeah ah yeah, there yeah, you go yeah. so so you were the timer yes very yeah, cool yeah. the uh the, the photo you took of gabby douglas from top down Tell me about the preparation on a shot like that. Well, that's that's your basic uh, remote in the ceiling, which is uh, different. Every building's different, but basically they all have some kind of catwalks, and you go up there and you have, you know, whatever lens you think is going to work. Usually a seventy to two hundred or three hundred or even a four if it's a big tall arena, and um, you hope that you have the good fortune that the catwalk goes right over the thing you want to shoot because a lot of times they don't. So you're shooting an off angle, but here, this that was in San Jose, uh, the Olympic trials for uh, Beijing, and the 
catwalk was dead over it, and it was just right down there. Now, the other thing with gymnastics and figure skating and any of those sort of performance uh, sports is you gotta, you, you gotta know the routine. You gotta watch the routine because everything happens so fast that if you're thinking, oh, that looks great, well, that doesn't look great anymore because it's gone. So that was something where I just watched her routine and they, and they warm up, they do the same routine. So watch your routine, wait for the moment, okay, because they don't look up very often when they are on the beam because they want to see the beam. And uh, so that was just, a, again, sort of uh, technical in terms of getting that camera up there, make sure you're firing it with uh, radio control, making it safe, putting a lot of safety cables around there, and then, um, then having the timing, just knowing what was going to happen. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you still, if you're going to shoot an NFL game, I mean, they're, they're you know, it, I don't want to diminish that. That's a lot of steps. <laughs> yeah. you, there's access. There's all this other stuff that goes into that yeah. particular picture. Do you, are you able these days to put in as much preparation in order to try to do to try to get good shots, or are you more of a a, a, a victim of standing back and saying, "Well, show me what happens"? And well, I mean, physically, uh, your opportunities are diminished because now. Uh, I mean, it's it's a hundred yard field with uh, five yard end zones. So it's a hundred and ten yard field, and fifty yards of each sideline is now bench area. So not only does that leave you not that much of an area to shoot at either end, it also means that for you to go around that bench takes you longer. You know, and I I'm not quite. I don't have the the burst that I had twenty years ago when I we go around the the bench at USC and the horse had come there. Everybody's like, horse, horse. And, oh you know. my God. Yes. And now and, and especially like SoFi, which I don't know why they made it the way they did, but it's very narrow behind that bench. So once they start rolling that that crane through, which they have on both sides, you are either ahead of them or you just stand back and let them go. So so physically, there's a lot more. But I mean, th there's so much information out about players and teams now that in a sense you can you know you can read about your game you can watch ESPN you can watch I mean you can watch full games on the NFL channel and so you can amass a lot of information uh, what where what you can do with it is limited by where you can shoot from got it where we, we've talked a, a little bit about the you know, the fact that hobbyists now have invested $20,000 yeah. plus in their cameras. Uh, you've got companies out there that are in the business essentially of giving photos away for like $7 or $8 yeah, a yeah, photo. Yeah. And I know that, I, you know, we at, here at this studio will still take on a, a handful of team and individual jobs a year. Mm -hmm. You know, the T&I work, and mm -hmm. where we can bring in some really good money. Yeah, yeah. But what do you think happens in the future? Do you think more of it comes in house to get rid of the licensing fees? Do you think Do you think that there's a resurgence of creativity? I mean, well, I think I, uh, I think of the Heinz. You know, and mm -hmm. part of this goes to the Heinz Klugmeier shot. Klu mm -hmm. Klugmeier. Yeah, Klugmeier. Heinz yeah. Klugmeier. Um, where the Phelps shot from under the bottom of the yeah, pool. Yeah. You know, now they they just realize that's a good shot, so they cut windows. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's well. That that's actually uh, that's a. Uh, lying, the camera's lying on the bottom of the right. pool, and and what Heinz, I mean Heinz has been shooting swimming forever, and he knows every swimmer and every race, and so the trick is you got to move that camera for different races, and so he had his guy in, in later years, uh, you know, go in the pool and position it exactly for for the different races. So that was. The key to that picture was really the positioning of the camera. That and just, you know, split second timing. Um, but they were watching on a, they had a live feed up to a, up to a monitor so they could, they could actually watch through the camera. So the investment in that, in that photo alone is no joke. No, no, it's, it's, it's an expensive house, expensive camera, expensive housing, a lot of wiring, all of which has to be waterproof. And every, every year at every big swim meet, somebody's housing leaks. You know, and it's always like, oh, too bad. Um, and then it's that, it, you know, really it's a two-man job. Yeah. Do you think the innovativeness like that can continue? I think so. I, I mean, I, one of the things I think is that, you know, uh, I mean, television's kind of taking the lead now. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, I watch, uh, I started watching uh, F1 racing, Formula One racing lately. And, and um, you know, I used to watch it years ago. And, here comes the cars, there goes the cars, whatever. Now there's 
there's a camera in the car, there's a camera on the driver's helmet, there's this incredible way to see the race that makes it really fascinating, you know, and, and this, this is all stuff that, you know, still cameras could do, but the, but the video is such quality that why would you need a still camera in there too? Yeah, that if you can get a video camera there shooting yeah. progressive frames, you could yeah. pull a still for, a yeah. mag for, for half of the thing yeah. here. Yeah, you know. So, so in that sense, I think a lot of the create there's still creativity, but a lot of it's being put into, into video, into motion shooting rather than still shooting. Yeah. Um, the uh, the photos you've taken for for Sports Illustrated. Do you have a favorite cover? Mm. I guess my uh, just these are more situational than than. Uh, Carl Lewis, the 84 Olympics, because that was a total surprise. It was my first Olympics. I had no idea that I was going to have that picture. I mean, I knew, I, I took that picture with a plan, but my plan was wrong. My plan was, it was the Saturday, the games ended on, on Sunday night, uh, no, maybe it was Friday, and he was, he'd already won three gold medals, and he's running in the 4 by 100 relay. He has not practiced at all with the other runners. So I'm thinking, he's going to drop that sucker. He's going to drop that baton. And so I went to, I mean, every, there are people all over. I was not even assigned a track. I was next door at boxing. But I came over for that race, and I just took a spot where he would come out of the fourth turn and uh, shot one roll of film. Boom, there he came. There he didn't drop it, won the gold medal, sent that into the lab as we did in those days, and then got the call on Monday morning. Oh, yeah, you got the cover. And I was going, oh, what? <laughs> you know. So that was that was a nice one. That was a thrilling one. It's a good picture too. But but uh, the fact, um, you know, uh, Jerry Rice from the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. uh, again, you know, the Super Bowl. You're there with seven, eight, nine. Everybody from SI is there. You're all shooting. There's going to be one cover. You want to get it. You know, and, and to an extent, that's that's the same way at the Olympics too. You want to get your covers because those are real mano a mano competitions. As opposed to, well, you got an assignment to go to to go to Green Bay, and the light was beautiful on Brett Favre, and you got a picture that was the cover. Mm -hmm. So what if you missed your uncle's funeral? <laughs> right. My cousins have never forgiven me for that. But but uh, uh, you know they're all different in that way. I mean, some of them, and some of them, you just go, oh my God, why is my name on there? You know, they do did some odd selections, but uh, yeah, you know. So have you ever missed one? It was right in front of you that you didn't get. No. Yeah. <laughs> what's what's your biggest miss? Oh, you know, it wouldn't have even been a cover. Um, I was in, this was 1988. I was at the East German, back when they had an East Germany, East German track and field trials. And they had a female athlete, Heike Dreschler, who was pretty much all around really, really good. Uh, let's not talk about drugs. But... Um, <laughs> And I mean, there was no, we're in Rostock, East Germany. There's nobody there, you know. And it was the end of the evening, and I wanted to take her out. I had my assistant, I had my lights, and I wanted to just take her out and make a nice, quiet portrait of her in the high jump pit, cause, long jump pit, because that's one of the events. And she said, Oh, I'm so tired, of, you know, and da 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 da. And I backed out. I didn't do it. And the next day, of course, she showed up in a sweatsuit, and it was the practice thing, and it was just a terrible picture. And I don't know what that picture would have been that night, but I think about it almost every day that I didn't do it, that I back, I back down. Because I probably could have convinced her to do it. I mean, even though they didn't like us over there, they knew who we were. And so, you know. So your biggest miss was a portrait. It surprises me, given how many misses I've had on the field. Oh, I've, I get I was looking I miss in the wrong the field all, all the time, you know. But, but uh, so much of that is where you were, you know, being in the right spot at the right time. When it, when it happens, right in front of me, I usually get it, you know, usually, uh, especially nowadays. I mean, cameras are so good now. That's, you know, I, I went out, I shot some uh, LA Galaxy soccer, and, uh, you know, I've got a Canon R3, and you can actually put it up to 30 frames a second, and you don't get rolling shutter like you do on the R5. And I'm out there, I shot 10,000 pictures during the I came home and I had them, and there were some great pictures, you know, and everybody, the, the all headers and feet off the ground and everything. And then I thought, so what? You know, everybody, as I looked through other people's stuff, they all had that stuff too. I mean, the cameras are so good now that it almost, to me, it takes away a little bit of the, 
the thrill when you got something really amazing. Everybody's getting amazing pictures. I mean, bless their hearts, but it's hard not to get an amazing picture these days. Well, sounds good. So what's next for you? You got a couple things coming up. I got some uh, sports, photog sports photography workshops coming. Got one in Eugene in September. That one looks like it's full, but uh, there is a waiting list if anybody drops out. And then we're just about to announce one in Las Vegas uh, with UNLV in uh, early November, November 6th through 11th. So I'll have a UNLV Fresno State game, which is a pretty good, pretty good game, Fresno State. And we'll have some basketball and we'll have some other crazy, some trapeze stuff from Vegas and everything. So that, that should be fun. And then I'm just rolling into the next year, probably going to Tempe in the spring. Nice. So, yeah. Well, sounds good. Hey, Peter. Always a pleasure, man. Thank, Thank you, you very much for coming by. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. It's been great talking to you. All right, Studio Life with Peter Reed Miller. Check him out, PeterReedMiller.com. Lots of info on his workshops. And, of course, come chill with us. We're still here talking <laughs> shit about yeah, studio talking crap. Talking shit. Yeah. There you go. Thanks, All Peter. Right. Hey, thank you, That wasn't so bad. Yeah. Always fun to no talk smoothie? To. Yeah, really. It's that's, taking that's her like an hour. Gonna be, it's going to be so melted. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Sure. Sure. Three, two, one. I did it. I made it through all of the interviews. Yeah. Oh, yeah.